if you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shack True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire, and you are listening to the Jean Benet Ramsey series. This is part 18 Unreleased Clues. We are going to go over an overlooked interview, an Ask Me Anything on Reddit, if you can call that an interview of sorts. The first one that Investigator Kolar had done. And quite a few little tidbits that many probably have either never known or have since forgotten about, but might hold some critical clues in solving this case. As always, if you find the Mind Shock podcast interesting and informative, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Hit that bell for notifications. Like and share Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, code podcast, or request. You can also become a member right here on YouTube. Just check the description. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. All right, so let's jump right in here. Make sure you've checked out the previous episodes. We went over a bunch of suspects. And uh, believe it or not, still way more. So this was posted in the so-called official Jean Benet Ramsey subreddit by M May three 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 a few years ago. Going over Kolar's first AMA, found several surprising answers he gave. Some that stood out to me are included below. As a side note. None of these are DNA-related, as there were far too many to address in one post. Question. Was it the conclusion of law enforcement that since there were no fingerprints on the ransom note that a stager or stagers or the killer himself may have been wearing gloves when writing the note? In your book, you referenced that lab technicians thought that the brown fibers found at the crime scene of the wine cellar may have been work gloves. It seems like a latex gloves offer a tighter fit and would be easier to use than work gloves when writing the ransom note with a sharpie. Did law enforcement ever find any evidence of latex gloves used that night? Answer. I don't believe there was any evidence developed regarding the use of latex gloves. Now, this is a curious answer here. No evidence was developed. Now, here is a note. Boulder Police Report number 1-1924. A neighbor who lived a few homes away from the Ramseys found a latex glove in her trash can in the alley. She didn't know how it had gotten there. Latex gloves are used by law enforcement officials to avoid contaminating evidence with their fingerprints. The glove, if part of the case, could have been used by an intruder or it could have been discarded there by a BPD officer. Also, notation here, Boulder Police Department Report number 2-37. That is curious, and there were no fluids, so the latex gloves is item number 59. And yes, no fluids as noted. So make of that what you will. Is it common for law enforcement? I guess if they're sweeping the neighborhood, they wouldn't take the latex gloves off. Do they randomly discard them in neighbors' trash cans? Again, I don't know the protocol for all of this involving police officers scavenging the area with latex gloves. But that's a curiosity nonetheless. Next question, what does JonBenet Ramsey's autopsy actually say regarding the final cause of death? Was it the blow to the head or asphyxia or some other factor? Answer, the coroner ruled the strangulation asphyxia created by the application of the garret was the cause of death. One only needs to read the autopsy report to know that's a half-truth. Okay, so that was his answer, but here's the notation here. The autopsy states, quote, cause of death of this six-year-old female is asphyxia by strangulation associated with craniocerebral trauma. Yeah, that is curious. So if it was a strike to the head and not the garret. 
Yeah, that's weird. And also, what's up with the blind faith in the one corner? Because, again, obviously there have been various uh, opinions regarding the, the autopsy and, and other so-called professionals. So I don't know. Yeah, it's it's also, yeah, I mean, that is weird. A lot of people just put blind faith not only in experts but in single experts while ignoring other experts. Authority worship and cultists really don't make a lot of sense. Like, let's follow science, not scientism. Question, so it wasn't done to cover up an accident. Answer, don't think so if I understand your question. Notation here. Of course he understood the question, so what is Kolar's theory? Yeah, he is being really weird in uh, in answering these questions and the way he's answering them. Very, very weird. Question, other than the fact that Patsy could not be excluded from the hand from handwriting of the note, does any physical evidence point to Patsy Ramsey that is not explainable by the fact that she was Jaminet's mother and therefore had close contact with her in the 24 hours before death? Answer, I think the answer to this relates to the fibers found on the sticky side of the duct tape used to cover JonBenet Ramsey's mouth. Laboratory analysis revealed that these fibers were microscopically and chemically, if I recall the correct language, consistent with the fibers collected from Patsy's jacket worn at the white party and on the morning of the reported kidnapping. Investigators posed the question, what were fibers from mom's jacket doing on the tape reportedly used by the kidnapper slash murderer to silence Jaminet? By all accounts, Patsy never got near the piece of tape. Tex believed direct contact had to have been made for the transfer to occur between the tape and the jacket. Of further note, it took nearly a year for Patsy to turn over that jacket to Boulder Police Department for analysis. Another illustration of the family's cooperation with authorities. Yeah, this is so, okay, none of this makes any sense because if they couldn't get a warrant for that, I mean, none of this really makes any sense. Also, if she wore the jackets at the white party, was the tape placed on JonBenet's mouth at the white party? And if it's not Patsy, would someone else have the wherewithal to, let's say, take the piece of tape, press it to the jacket, and then put it on JonBenet's mouth? That way it would fool all the gullible goofs like Kolar. Again, if he's not being in if he's not intentionally deceiving here. Some notations here. Patsy did not wear the jacket the morning of the 26th. Quote from Thomas. French walked up a curving sidewalk lined with Christmas decorations and large candy canes, small lights glittering in the darkness, and met me and was met at the front door by a distraught dark-haired woman in black pants and a red sweater. That's interesting. So why is Kohler saying she, Patsy not only wore the jacket at the white party, but also on the morning of the reported kidnapping? And how would he know if, he, if she wore that jacket? Further notations here on Reddit. There were four red fibers found that were consistent with her red and black jacket. Hardly enough needed for direct contact. From Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, the lab had been sent a red blouse and sweater, black pants, and a red and black checker, checked jacket belonging to Patsy. Now, the CBI reported that the fibers were not consistent with the slacks or the sweater, but were consistent with a jacket Patsy had worn the night JonBenet had been murdered. The CBI could not say for sure the fibers didn't come from some other piece of clothing made of the same material, but this important evidence would be included in the police presentation. Yeah, this is actually very interesting because, so what type of jacket was it? So would any would it match any jacket of that color, of that type? Because if it was a unique jacket that nobody else had, okay, then this is, there's there might be something here because then the only way they could get on there is either because it was her or because somebody was specifically framing her using the jacket. Or if it belongs to any jacket of that type and it's a popular type jacket, what does this really mean? Further notations here from the Bonita Papers. Cellmark Laboratories, who conducted the testing on the tape, found red, blue, pink, purple, and brown cloth fibers and animal fur, probably beaver. That's interesting. So there were a whole bunch of different types of fibers, and only the, only the red ones, the four red ones, were consistent with the jacket, which may or may not have been Patsy's. And then there were also a whole bunch of other fibers. 
Yeah, that's weird. Okay, further notations. It took nearly a year for the police to receive the clothes the Ramses wore that day because the police didn't ask for them until December 97. Oh man, Kolar is so intentionally deceptive. Wow, that's weird. Okay. So, sources here. Boulder Police Report number 1-4. 1429. According to correspondence between the Boulder Police Department and a Ramsey defense investigator, clothing John and Patsy were wearing on the evening of December 25th, 96 wasn't requested by investigators until one year later in December 97. On March 3rd, 98, Detective Trulio of the Boulder Police Department met with a Ramsey PI, during which time Trulio collected clothing purported to belong to the Ramseys. A letter from the investigation commander on the case at that time supports the request for the clothing one year after the murder. Okay, we also have Boulder Police Department report number 1-1430 here. Another police report indicates some pieces of clothing belonging to Patsy and John were turned over to the police January 28, 97, approximately four weeks after their daughter's murder. From John, two black shirts. From Patsy, black pants and a red and black sweater. There is no indication if one or both of these reports may be correct if there's a mistake related to the date discrepancy. Well, I guess they could both be correct because that doesn't pertain to the jacket. So four weeks after the murder, they turned over a bunch of clothing, and then supposedly a year later they turned over more clothing as requested. Interesting. From Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, more than a year after the Jomini Ram- Jomini Ramsey was murdered, her parents have turned over to Boulder Police the clothing they were wearing the night before their six-year-old daughter was found in their home. Two months after police finally made the request, they received two shirts, a pair of pants, and a sweater this week from John and Patsy Ramsey, according to sources. Authorities sought the clothing to compare the fibers found in the case, sources said. Yeah, that's weird. So either one report is wrong or they're both correct, and they were just different pieces of clothing handed over at different times. So... It says here, according to, so perfect murder, perfect town. So not police reports is stating that they took two months. So there was a request and then it took two months. So were they not living in Boulder? If they were out of town, I mean, that could make sense because then it has to go through a bunch of channels. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But in any case, wow, Kolar framed that so intentionally deceptively. Wow. I mean, this is really quite the expose into Kolar. Question, were the golf clubs Mr. Ramsey had removed from the house ever recovered? And if so, was any testing done on them? And if so, what are the results? Answer, to my knowledge, the clubs were never sought by investigators after the Ramseys moved from their home. And wow, completely wrong. So there's a lab report here. Exhibit 319, golf club, no blood indicated. Hair, fiber, and or fiber controls were collected. Exhibit 308, golf club cover. So this is a CBI report. Uh, The document number here, it's no longer available online, but the title of the document was 1996-1230-CBIRPT.PDF, and these are the exhibit numbers. It's no longer online from jeanbenetramsey.pbworks.com, but yeah, so the exhibit, also exhibit 308, golf club cover, no seminal fluid indicated, hair fiber and or fiber controls were collected, and there were also search warrants here, golf clubs for GLI, golf club 79 BAH, and golf club cover 50 BAB. So, wow, Kolar, to his knowledge, so he's really not that knowledgeable on this case. Question, do you believe the scream came from Patsy Ramsey or JonBenet Ramsey? Answer, under my theory, Patsy, JonBenet Ramsey never would have been able to scream after being struck unconscious. Well, this is really weird, because who said the scream was from that particular strike? She could have screamed at any time before. She could have screamed as somebody's winding up to strike her. She could have screamed as someone is pulling her into a room. I mean, she could, yeah, Cola, I don't under, I don't know what to make of Kolar. Either he's just that dumb or he's intentionally trying to frame a narrative here. Because who said the scream had to have come from a strike? And if so, maybe it did come from like a light slap earlier and then that wasn't the death-inducing blow. I mean, this is like Logic 101 here. Like the way, this is so weird. This is so weird. I've never heard a so-called investigator answer questions like this. 
Let's let's do a quick aside here before we get back to this. So, he, on his LinkedIn here, A. James Kolar, Telluride Marshall's Department, went to University of California, Santa Barbara, retired chief. About James Kohler began his law enforcement career with Boulder, Colorado Police Department in 76 as a reserve police officer. Over the course of his career, he served as a patrol officer, detective, detective sergeant, supervisor of the department's narcotics and intelligence unit, and as a sergeant in the Uniform Patrol Division. In collateral duties, he served as assistant commander for the SWAT team, the coordinator for the department's gang unit, and as a supervisor for the recruit officer field training and evaluation program. He instructed nationally on the topic of the San Jose-based FTEP program for Kaminsky and Associates for over a decade. Kohler left the Boulder Police Department in 93 to take the chief's position in the mountain resort community of Telluride, Colorado. For nearly 11 years, and in response to community growth, he managed the operations of the department, building and expanding upon the components of administration, patrol investigations, and code enforcement. After retiring after approximately 28 years of law enforcement service, he accepted an investigator's position with the 20th Judicial District Attorney's Office in Boulder, Colorado in June 2004. As chief investigators for the DA's office, he assumed the lead role for the JonBenet Ramsey cold case homicide investigation. The town of Telluride subsequently recruited Kolar back to the chief's position in March 2006. Since that time, he served six years on the executive board of the Colorado Association of Chiefs of Police as a representative for the southwest region of the state and is currently serving a two-year term as the chair of Colorado's CCIC Board of Executive Directors. He serves as a vice chair for the San Miguel County Emergency Telephone Service Authority and is a member of Colorado's Western Slope Joint Terrorism Task Force. Okay. Okay, so this guy seemingly quite accomplished with so many decades of experience. Not only that, but he's the chief investigator, the lead role in the Jean-Benet Ramsey investigation, and he doesn't know about the golf clubs, and he can't answer basic logic 101 questions. He's hallucinating that any scream from Jean-Benet Ramsey could have only been made from a strike. Not a second before. I mean, this level of goofery, would we expect that from a, a man as accomplished as Kohler? Or is this definitive, intentional steering? Now, let's look at Boulder Police Reports 1-1390, 1-174, and 1-175. A Ramsey neighbor, quote, stated that she heard one loud, inaudible scream, that was the loudest, most terrifying scream she had ever heard. It was obviously from a child. Let me go over that again. Directly from the Boulder Police Report, which no doubt Kolar would have read and known about as the lead chief investigator. It was obviously from a child. And lasted from three to five seconds, at which time it stopped abruptly. So three to five seconds is definitely long enough to, to determine possible, I mean, if it was clear enough to whoever's listening, whether it was a child or, or an older woman or a middle-aged woman. So <laughs> if it was only like one super brief scream, I mean, yeah, it could be kind of hard to tell, kind of hard to remember. But if it's a sustained three to five second blood curling scream that would haunt your nightmares forever, especially if you know what happened after, I mean, would someone forget such a scream and be that level of mistaken? According to Kolar, yes. According to the Boulder Police report, the department report and the neighbor stating it was obviously from a child, no. She thought the parents surely would hear that scream. The scream came from across the street south of the Ramsey residence. And it happened between midnight and 2 a.m. Wait, the scream came from across the street? South of the Ramsey residence. Is that a typo? Was that heard from across the street or came from across the street? This is weird. Huh. And supposedly there's a bigger window here. I, ha I had thought that it was kind of nailed to around midnight, maybe 1230-ish. It's stating here between midnight and 2 a.m., so that's a bigger range. And it also states came from across the street south of the Ramsey residence. Huh. That's pretty weird. 
That's pretty weird, unless that's a typo. But what's not, I mean, it states here, it was obviously from a child. I don't know how that could be mistaken by anybody other than Kolar, I guess. Next question here. I've heard that your book focuses heavily on Burke as a suspect. Do you have any statistics on the incidence of sibling murder in the U.S.? How common is it for a nine-year-old to sexually abuse and murder his kid's sister? Answer. I have not checked the statistics collected on child offenders since Foreign Faction was published. So thanks for your question. I will gather those updated stats for the upcoming second edition ebook release. In short, yes, there are many documented instances in which 9- and 10-year-olds have committed acts of sexual assault and murder. Notation here, really, question mark, where, question mark, does he include those stats in the second edition ebook release? Serious question. Here's what's weird. So this chief investigator with decades of experience, he didn't even, he didn't even pull the stats that would support his main theory. I mean, what level of goofery is this? I mean, this guy's supposedly a serious chief investigator with decades of experience. I mean, this is weird. I mean, literally in any case where maybe someone is alleging boyfriend, ex-boyfriend of a, of a female that met with foul play, I mean, obviously you're going to bring up the statistics that that's the statistical likelihood. And depending on the year, you know, statistics, is, statistics could vary, but it's the overwhelming majority of females met with foul play are met with foul play at the hands of either a boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, husband, ex-husband, some kind of, some, uh, uh, someone they know, not a stranger. And obviously you'd include those stats, yet this guy, I mean, this is really weird. I mean, this is really kind of exposing Kolar here. Question. I read that the Ramses had given out no fewer than 15 house keys to random people. Nannies, gardeners, housekeepers, etc. Any insight on whether that's true? Thanks in advance. Answer. I did not waste my time researching the Ramses' changing story about keys being passed out to the kingdom. They originally told investigators that John Andrew and their housekeeper had keys, and then the number increased exponentially. Kohler apparently didn't waste his time on researching who had keys to the Ramsey home, but still, oh, so that was his answer in notation. Kohler apparently didn't waste his time on researching who had keys to the Ramsey home, but still made the following statement in his $25 paperback. Quote, no keys had been lost or stolen, and the only other people who had keys to the residence were Patsy's mother, John's oldest son, John Andrew, and the housekeeper, Linda Hoffman Pugh. End quote. However, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town states the following individuals had keys. Patsy Ramsey, John Ramsey, John Andrew Ramsey, Nedra and Don P Powell, Fleet and Priscilla White, Jay Pettipies, the painter, Joe Barnhill, the neighbor, the Fernies, Linda Wilcox, housekeeper, slash former housekeeper, Linda Hoffman Pugh, housekeeper, Suzanne Savage, the babysitter. I mean, this is straight from the Boulder Police Department reports. 1-6505, 1-1264. John and Pastor Ramsey had given several keys to subcontractors. Friends and neighbors, Boulder Police Report 1-1104, most of which were not returned. This comes information also from Woodward. Several police department reports indicate that investigators talked with more than 35 people outside the family about whether they had keys to the home. Uh, Boulder Police Reports 5-3920, 5-3921. Patsy Ramsey, while preparing for the tour of homes, openly told a variety of people where a key was hidden outside the home under a statue. The key was not found during a check for it after John Bonet's murder. I mean, so this is critical information that Kohler, quote, didn't waste time on. I mean, the spare key or whatever that Patsy apparently told a ton of people wasn't even found. And this goof didn't even waste time. I mean, this critical aspect of the case. And, and how does he not know what's even stated in the Boulder Police Department reports? I mean, this is insane. This is the chief investigator. Like, what is going on with Kohler? I mean, does anybody have respect left for this guy? I mean, this is so weird. And it was the way that he stated that, too. He didn't waste his time researching. I mean, what kind of an honest, invest, an honest, competent investigator doesn't pursue that angle? If anything else, just to rule it out. So, again, the spare key was never found. 
And apparently, I don't know if this is true, but we went over this in previous podcast episodes. Did they not change the house keys when they moved in? Because I read that as well. I don't have the source in front of me right now, but we went over that in the early episodes. So if that's the case, I mean, there's really an unlimited amount of people that could have had the key. And Kolar doesn't consider that, uh, <laughs> he doesn't consider that pertinent. He doesn't consider that worthy of any investigation time. That's weird. Okay, also Karn's, uh, in Karn's book here, 86, at least seven windows and one door were found open on the morning of December 26, 90, uh, December 26, 96. Okay, next question. Where in Jean Benet's room were the feces smeared pajama bottoms thought to belong to Burke found? If they were in plain sight, is there a crime scene photograph of them? Were they collected? Was the feces smeared candy box collected? If not, do you know why not? Answer. It is my recollection that the PJ bottoms were on the floor, but I didn't see that they or the box of candy were collected. It was an odd observation noted by investigators, but I don't think they grasped the significance of those items at the time. Interviews were still being conducted with family employees and friends during and well after the completion of the execution of the warrants. Notes. Kolar certainly made some bold claims regarding these items that, according to him, CSI didn't find significant. How on earth would a box covered in feces not be significant? Below is a portion of Patsy's interview with the police where they discuss the pants that were turned inside out and found on JonBenet's bedroom floor. This is with Tom Haney. How about 378? Patsy says, this is JonBenet's floor, her pants. Haney asks, do you recall those particular pants? When she would have worn those last? Patsy responds, not for sure. Probably recently because they were dropped in the middle of the floor, but I don't remember exactly. Haney states they are kind of inside out. Patsy responds, right. Haney says, 379 is a close-up of it. It appears they are stained. Patsy says, right. Haney says, is that something that JonBenet had a problem with? Patsy states, well, she, you know, she was at an age where she was learning to wipe herself, and you know, sometimes she wouldn't do such a great job. Haney states, did she have accidents, if you will, in the course of the day or the night, as opposed to just bedwetting? Patsy responds, not usually, no. That would probably be from just not wiping real well. Potential search warrant items in questions, gift box with black velvet, 12JRB, and blue sweatpants, 34BAH. Question. Chief Kohler, what is your opinion of the fact that Patsy's sister was allowed to go in the house and remove enough property to completely fill the back of a squad car? I understand that none of the things she took were cataloged or inspected. Didn't the fact that John want his golf bag in the middle of winter raise any alarms? I... S well... It depends... So did he have another golf bag in Atlanta or not? I simply find it mind-boggling that this was allowed to happen, especially when she was going there under the premise of getting clothing for the Ramses to wear to the funeral. Answer. I didn't see that any of the things that Pam removed from the home had been cataloged in any specific detail, but I could have missed that document. Investigators denied her access to the basement, so she was unable to collect John's golf bag. Steve Thomas raised that very question about his need for his clubs at that time of year, and given the circumstances pressing upon the family with his daughter's death. Well, see, again, that depends on a few different things. Again, I'm not defending John Ramsey in any way, but so let's take him out of the equation before, the gullo, before all the goofs get triggered. Now, in a case where there's some kind of family tragedy, if an individual finds golf some kind of soulless or relaxing activity, that would be the time they turn to it in times of, of grief to, to relax them or calm them. I mean, everybody has these types of activities. Again, I am not saying that John Ramsey is this type of person or that golf was this, this an activity that he would use in this way. I'm just, again, presenting some food for thought where it wouldn't necessarily be strange. Now, if he also has another golf club set in Atlanta that he would use in Atlanta, then it is strange because why would he need that one in Boulder? If that's his Boulder set and it's winter... Obviously, that's weird. But if he only has one set and he takes it back and forth, I mean, again, I don't know. Some rich people have a lucky set that they always play with. Not that they can't afford another one. They simply prefer their one set. So, so yeah, without knowing, without knowing whether or not he had another set in Atlanta, where, of course, you could probably play throughout the winter, depending on, obviously, depending on the day. But So another interesting note here from investigative journalist... Paula Woodward, so quote here, 
That same Saturday, Patsy's sister Pam went to the Ramsey home to collect clothing and personal items for the family. Pam said the officer on duty at the front door told her she could go in and get what she wanted. She insisted he accompany her and make a list of what she took. The WHYD investigative archive, however, states from a police report that the officer only allowed Pam to stand in the doorway of each room and tell the officer what she wanted to bring back. The officer would then take the item and catalog it before giving it to Pam. Okay, so we have basically three different stories here. We have the general story that's, again, I don't see any sources for it, where she basically went in and took whatever she wanted. Now, in, in her account, she stated that she insisted that the officer make a list of what she took. Okay, interesting. And then we have a third account, supposedly, from Boulder Police Reports, which may have been made just to cover this cover-up incompetence. I mean, we don't know, unless, of course, the report is true. In which case, Pam wasn't even allowed to actually take anything herself. The, she just pointed out and the officer took it. So we have three completely different accounts of what transpired in how she got these items from the home. Make of that what you will. Actually, there might be even more accounts. Let's go to the JonBenet Ramsey subreddit. There's a thread here from Standard Neutral. Pam Pow given police vest during raid on Ramsey House. No matter how much I research this case, I always find new information. Allegedly, when Pam Pow, Patsy's sister, came to take items out of the house, she was given a police vest so she could work undisturbed and not catch the attention of the media. I'm looking for more info and sources on this, but as I understand it, she made off with a ton of stuff from the house, including JonBenet's pageant outfits, bed linens, and other household items. Why was she allowed access to the house in this way? She removed items from the scene of a homicide that could have solved the case, or is it not that big of a deal? Question mark. Of all the mishandling of the crime scene, this is almost never discussed. So, some discussion here from Michael. The fact that they didn't have two officers watch her as she took the items needed for the funeral and kept track of everything she took baffles me. No streetlights responded. Um, they did. Where did you hear that Pam just went rogue, grabbing up stuff randomly and walking out? Steve, Steve's book, Steve Thomas, wasn't there. Michael, or uh, Michaela responded... That's how I remembered it. Slightly exaggerated on my part. And yes, Steve Thomas may not have been there, but here is his description of the list that was taken of items taken from the home, page 52. Everett kept only a general inventory of what was removed, and even that abbreviated listing was astonishing. Stuffed animals, tiaras, three dresses for JonBenet, pageant photo portfolios, toys and clothes for Burke, John Ramsey's daytime... What is a daytime? I don't know what that is. The desk, or is that a magazine? The desk Bible and clothing. For Patsy, there were black pants, dress suits, boots, and the contents of the curio cabinet. Bills, credit cards, and a black cashmere trench coat. Jewelry that included her grandmother's ring and an emerald necklace. Bathrobes, a cell phone. Uh-oh. Person, how many, and how many cell phones did they have? Did John or Patsy have personal phones, and then did John also have an access graphic cell phone? Or possibly additional phones? Personal papers, bank records, Christmas stockings, her Nordstrom's credit card, and even their passports. The patrol car was loaded with zipped bags, boxes, sacks, and luggage. The true contents unknown. And here's the other thing, too. Why are there even so many different versions of this? Does anybody find that problematic? Just the fact that there are so many different stories and versions and nothing is nailed down or corroborated? I mean, even law enforcement sources seem to be uh, contradictory on a lot of this stuff, or, or none of these details can be exactly nailed down. Kenny Jasmine, Kenny's Jasmine responded with even more stories here. 
It's crazy that they would even allow her inside. I read several times that she even had the police car stop through a fast food drive-in to get her some lunch. This is a rumor. From Steve Thomas inside the Rams Investigation, page 51, quote, Patrol Officer Angie Chromiak told me later that when she showed up to pull a security shift at Tin Cup Circle, she was ordered by police headquarters to ferry Pam Pow over to 15th Street to collect some clothing that John Patsy and Burke Ramsey could wear to the funeral. Even that decision, as kind as it may have been to grieving parents, was questionable for nothing should be removed from an active crime scene. Page 52, quote, She spent an hour on our first trip to the crime scene and emerged with a big cardboard box filled to the brim, which she plopped, that's an interesting choice of word, plopped, into the trunk, not put, but plopped, into the trunk of the police car. For the next several hours, Pam made about half a dozen trips through the house, often spending an hour or more inside, and hauled out suitcases, boxes, bags, and loose items until the back seat of the police car was stuffed like a steamer trunk. Pam's last trip, so there's several trips in and out of the, out of the house. Pam's last trip was into the bedroom of Jamine, and she pumped herself up again, quote, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this, end quote. She came back carrying an armload of stuffed animals and other items from the first room in the house to have been sealed off by police. Everett kept only a general inventory. Okay, I already read that part. Okay, wow. I mean, the cell phone definitely stands out there because how many cell phones did the Ramses have? Gretchen posted that the Ramses had multiple cell phones. Huh. It would be curious on how many phone logs from how many different cell phones they had. And are these all cell phones on the same plan or are there different plans, like a business versus personal with different records? And did police actually, were they actually able to access all the records for all the phones? Other people, even users, profiles since deleted, stated that she disposed of, of the weapon. I would postulate... Did she do that unknowingly? Huh. So yeah, we have quite a few... I mean, there's one more thing here. She would, uh, Pam Powell was on the Larry King Live show, October 19th, 98. Some reference here, she stated, quote, But I know that on the 28th, when I had to enter the home to get some personal belongings some clothing and obviously some things appropriate for Jean Bonnet's burial, I knew then that the police had made up their mind that Patsy and John had done this hideous thing. Larry King stated, you must have been totally shocked then. Pam said, well, of course I was. Larry, did you speak to any police officer? Did you say to anyone, you people are nuts? Pam responded, of course I did. Larry asked, and what did they say? Pam stated, not much. They just kept asking me a bunch of questions while I was in the home. Okay, so Pam is basically corroborating here that everybody thought that the Ramses did it at this point. But why are they letting her remove cell phones and all these things then? I mean, does, does this make sense from any angle? It seems like it doesn't really make sense from any angle. And why... Why are there so many different stories of whether she was escorted, whether she wasn't, how many trips in and out, what she took, how she took it, and even whether or not she had a police vest? Benny Baku posted this in response to this post. I may be misremembering, but I thought Patsy's jacket had red, black, and gray checks in it. I will have to go back in the interviews and read a description of the jacket. Still, the fact that the Ramses kept the clothes they wore that night is amazing especially if they were involved in a murder. Here, here's the other thing, too. Is it possible Patsy had more than one jacket that had similar fabric and colors? Like, when someone likes a particular brand of jacket, they might have different ones, right? Like, people with certain shoes, they like they have different... They might even have more than one of the same exact type. I mean, I've even known non-rich people who liked a particular piece of clothing or jacket or shoes where they had two of the same exact model. Or they just like a particular brand and they have a few not exact items but similar items. They could certainly afford it, right? So is it possible 
there were two different jackets with similar fibers. I mean, they didn't take an interview of every single jacket Patsy Ramsey had, right? They were only interested in the one she wore the night before and in the mornings, possibly, if she wore one that morning. Would they have actually gone through her entire wardrobe? I mean, how many jackets did a woman like that have? A, a former beauty queen married to this rich guy working for a company who just crossed a billion dollars. So, yeah, I mean, nobody's really bringing that up. I think that's very relevant here. But continuing uh, Benny Baku's post here, and that's also another good point from him. Like, why would they keep the clothes, right? I suspect their lawyers told them to hang on to them because the BPD would want them eventually once they got their shitola together. The problem with fiber evidence, unless the garment is so rare, so unique, especially in this case, consistent as well, almost redundant. Patsy changed her out of the pants to the long johns. She tucked her into bed. If she was wearing the jacket when she did so, they were left on Jean Benet or the blanket. The fibers could have transferred from Jean Benet onto the blanket. Fleet dropped the tape onto the blanket, and there you go. The problem is the fiber evidence has been played loose by the BPD trying to connect Patsy to the crime with no official reports except Woodward. We take Thomas and Kolar's word for it? No thank you. In my opinion, BPD played fast and loose with their investigation and Kolar was the worst of them. I mean, that would explain a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, regardless of what the real truth is, again, this is mind shock. I'm not claiming anybody's innocent. I'm not claiming anybody's guilty. I'm not claiming anything is true or untrue. I'm just looking at this logically, and there's a lot of goofery here. There's a lot of goofery. It might have been unintentional. I mean, maybe Kolar's really just is a clueless goof. I mean, you know, law enforcement is, is no exception to the field where a lot of yes men just get promoted. Because, you know, they play well with others or the people that matter up top and they get promoted, not, not in relation to their competency. You see this in every single field. Obviously, authority-worshipping cultists and all these clueless goofs that just worship experts and authorities, they just, they're too mentally weak to conceive of the possibility that people get promoted because they're, you know, they're buddy-buddy with certain people. Nepotism, cronyism... All that stuff, connections, favors, you know, just the politics of everything. It's not necessarily related to competency. I would actually even argue, I don't know the percentages, I would say a pretty decent percentage of the time, possibly even majority percentage. In most industries, this is the case. Eggnog Shake posted in, We have your daughter. Paula Woodward says the coroner told her that he put the two causes, strangulation and head blow, together because he did not know what came first. If the strangulation came first, which I strongly believe it did, it completely blows Kolar's theory completely out of the water. There is an RDI theory that supports strangulation first, pr first proposed by Dr. Cyril Wecht. However, I really think we need to be able to agree on this basic fact to get accurate theories. The autopsy says she had petechea. She has a horrifying big red neck injury if you have seen the autopsy photos. That means her heart was still beating, trying to get blood to the brain, but was prevented from doing so by the strangulation that was occurring. The lack of blood in the brain is very significant, less than a teaspoon. This was an eight and a half inch crack in her skull. If that head blow came first, there would have been massive bleeding and swelling. There wasn't. Barely any blood, as Dr. Cyril Wecht says. If she had been struck in the head first, there would have been at least enough time for blood to rush to the head, causing swelling and even more bleeding. I don't know who killed Jean Bonnet, but I do know what happened to Jean Bonnet. Now, there is actually something we haven't discussed here. This is actually very curious. We have not discussed this yet on Mindshock. I Gatsby posted her brain was 1,450 grams, which was huge for a tiny six-year-old girl. That's closer to being the size of an adult male's brain. It takes time for the brain to swell that much after being struck. May responded, that's not entirely true, and I know we've spoken about this before. At birth, the average baby's brain is about a quarter of the size of the average adult brain. Incredibly, it doubles in size in its first year. It keeps growing by about 80% of adult size by age 3, and 90% nearly fully grown by age 5. By age 2, it is at 75% of its adult weight at 95% by age 6, and at 100% by age 7. Wow, this is, I actually did not know this. This is pretty crazy. The, 
your brain weighs the same at seven years old as it does as when you're an adult? Huh. There's no source here for this, but at age 20, the average weight of the male brain is approximately 1,400 grams. And by the age of 65, brain weight is approximately 1,300 grams. Brain weight for female follows a similar trend, although the total weight is 125. 100 to 150 grams less than that of males. So Jean Bonnet was six, not seven, and her brain was 1,450 grams. That's pretty big. Huh. Yeah, this is actually kind of weird, so perhaps she was struck first. I think this is all critically important, and, and I guess you would have no way of knowing how much her brain weighed the year before, the year before that, etc., etc. Unless, of course, people speculating that that's not her body. There's all sorts of theories out there. I mean, it is kind of curious that nobody really talks about brain size, even though there was no supposedly no actual bleeding in them. I mean, yeah, there's so many problems here with this case. Also, supposedly... So, huh. Also, without knowing the exact manner, after being strangled, the brain actually could swell as well. I mean, this really is a unique case. You don't see this level of just people on different page, completely different pages, with so many of these other cases. It's just... Yeah, I mean, the brain size and the order of injury, this is really, this seems very critical. So Dr. Meyer wasn't aware of any head wound first because the swelling and hemorrhaging was internal from the injury. That's also kind of curious. I mean, you're going to hit somebody that hard and there's going to be barely a mark on the outs on the exterior. I mean, none of this really makes any sense, does it? I mean, it really, really doesn't. So, yeah, just a short one today. I will be following up with more theories. We do have some very, very dark and sinister theories that we still haven't gone over, believe it or not. I mean, this is already the most comprehensive uh, podcast series on the Jean Bonnet case, but we're not even done. So that's it for now. Hope everybody found another edition interesting and informative and comprehensive. As usual, in typical mind shock fashion, attempting not to fall for any silly logical fallacies. You can donate to our PayPal, help support the channel, help us get more mind shocking podcasts out there, and keep up awareness in unsolved and cold cases, wrongful convictions, missing person cases, and more. Awareness is what gets cases solved. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications. If you're not getting them, just hit like and share. If you're on mind shock right now, make sure you're also subscribed to the Bruce McGuire channel. I post a lot of stuff on there that I do not post on the mind shock the main mind shock channel you could also become a member like and share twitter facebook reddit patreon questions comments theories thoughts suggestions rebuttals debunks of any kind leave them in the comment section this is bruce mcguire signing off catch you guys next time